I'm Thomas W. Dortch, Jr., Chairman of 100 Black Men of America, Incorporated. I welcome each of you to the 100 Black Men Ed Choice Virtual Education Town Hall. We hope that we will hear your voices and your thoughts today on how we can ensure we have quality education for all. We can hear your thoughts about what we can and must do to improve education. But more importantly, how do we ensure that we're going to have bright futures for all of our young people? So after the main session, you'll have an opportunity in breakout rooms to share more of your thoughts, to report out, but we want to make sure we continue to, to communicate. Education is the key for everything that we do, and it is the key for individuals having bright futures. The late Mayor Maynard Jackson often said that we will succeed by the ballot, the buck, and the book. That's what he was taught by his father and grandfather and his family, and he brought that to many of us. We've been engaged in the balloting process by voting. We've tried to step it up a little bit more in the buck area by looking at economic empowerment and all of our businesses and how we have access there. But the one area we must do much more in is the book, in the educational arena. Education, again, is the key. So let us hear your voices. Let's stay engaged, not just at this town hall today, but for the future. We must work to ensure we have stronger educational systems, that we have responsible school boards who are focused on education and access for all. And in the 100, we will continue to be at the forefront to ensure equal access for all of our young people and quality education in our communities. So thank you for joining us. Let us hear your voices. And again, we must continue this all year long. Thank you. Greetings. I'm Emory Edwards, and I'm the Outreach Director here at EdChoice. EdChoice is a national organization committed to ensuring that every family has the freedom to attend whatever school works best for them. We are excited to partner with 100 Black Men of America to bring you this virtual education town hall. We've curated this town hall to have some candid discussions around what we can do as a collective community to improve education for black and brown students and ensure that they have the support and resources they need from our educational systems. Our esteemed group of panelists will provide their thoughts and insights as experts in their field and as parents themselves on issues affecting the current state of education in our community. We also want to hear from you as well. If you're watching our opening session via Facebook Live, please leave your thoughts in the comments section. If you're watching via email or our town hall hub, please leave your thoughts in the comment box at the bottom of the hub page. We're opening this town hall with a session entitled Adapting to the Pandemic, Reimagining K-12 Education to Address the Needs of Black Students and Parents. We know the COVID-19 pandemic has brought to light many significant gaps and inequities within our education ecosystem. As schools shifted to online learning environments, Families were forced to adapt and find resources to ensure their students continue receiving a quality education. However, we know many families endured and are still enduring significant hurdles in adapting to this new normal. Our moderator, Chris Stewart, will lead our panelists, Curtis Valentine, Sekou Biddle, Dr. Kathleen Amaz, and Dr. Tremaine Clardy, in a discussion around the differing experiences that families are facing in these turbulent times and how the K-12 education system can address and support the needs of Black students and families. I hope that you will enjoy this captivating conversation that they have for you. Well, I'm ready for a great conversation with an esteemed panel of individuals to help us sort out what Black families and Black students can expect in terms of challenges and possible solutions when it comes to COVID-related educational change. Um, I'm sure everyone is familiar with the saying, when America catches a cold, Black folks catch the flu. So when uh, American education is disrupted for white families and better resource family, Black families have uh, a lot more challenges when it comes to making sure their kids are connected, making progress, that they don't have their learning interrupted, and that they can be found and seen, by the way. We have so many African-American children that are not just falling behind. We don't know whether they're falling behind or not because we simply don't have them connected 
there's still 18 million families in the United States that don't even have the sufficient bandwidth to get online. And I bandwidth, I'm, I should say, access to the internet. Um, and that's a real problem if we expect them to be getting distance learning, distance education that keeps them moving and progressing. Finally, I'll say before this, no one here probably would have told you that black students were doing great or perfect before COVID. So if COVID is so bad, uh, we really have to believe that for our children, we should have an excited sense of like urgency about making sure that they're getting what they need. With that, I would love to jump in and um, so we have an esteemed panel. I said that earlier. We have Dr. Kathleen Mons Edwards, or Edward Mons, I'm sorry. And uh, <laughs> I told you I was gonna g g be messing with these names. Um, we have Curtis Valentine, uh, Sekou Biddle, and Dr. Tremaine Clarity. Um, we have amongst these folks, uh, expertise in homeschooling, in college to career, in public policy, and in actually school district work and how, how we might be thinking about how we work with school districts to make sure that our kids get what they need. And I would love to um, jump in from the very beginning and ask anybody if they have a great analysis of where you think we are now. In the spring, schools shut down. Parents were getting their first blush of having kids at home full time. We had an entire summer to be rethinking what we're gonna do for kids. And now we're back in school again, supposedly. Um, where do you think we are now in terms of how families are coping and managing and whether or not we're getting on track with their kids getting the learning that they need every day? Yeah, Chris, I'll take a stab at that. Um, you know, not to be too hyperbolic and, and to put this out there, like I'm, I'm seeing this through the lens of both, you know, the sort of professional perspective at work um, but also, frankly, like, first and foremost, as a parent, right? I got a, one student in high school right now and one away at college. Um, I think the way I would describe where we are right now is, like, we're in the first act of, like, an education disaster movie. And the challenge, frankly, is that I think a lot of people think we're, like, in the third act, right? And we're getting ready to go back to school, you know, in calendar year 21, and it's going to all be good. Um, and I think that we're like really far from that. And we're also really far from, from acknowledging that we've got two major things to pull off. Like first, we got to solve for how do we minimize the lost opportunity for students through the remainder of the time the school is disrupted because of the pandemic. And, you know, all bets are off. That could be, you know, early 2021. It could be throughout the remainder of 2021. Um, and the second, and I think the bigger thing is actually, what's our recovery plan that accounts for the disruption and lost opportunity that students will have gone through both educationally, like their overall development, social, emotional, and everything else, mental health. What's our plan and how do we resource and execute it over the next however many years so that everybody who's lost something in the window that we're currently still in and will end sometime hopefully in the midterm future to recover from that because if we don't come up with one like we used to talk you know we talked in the past about you know achievement and opportunity gaps like we're in the midst of taking you know a gap and turning it into like a canyon that will never be bridged if we don't actively do something. And I think, you know, you mentioned public policy. I mean, I, I served on elected school board and city council. Like, this is the kind of thing that doesn't get solved without like a significant public commitment to A, recognize like the inequity that's baked into our public education systems and like a real lean into how to fix it. So that's where I think we are right now. I agree with you, Sekou, and in fact, one of the things, uh, when, when our family left Michigan and went to South Georgia, uh, it was around 1999 when it was a whole Y2K uh, period, and there was a book that I read that, that I chuckle and I'll share the title, it's called Don't Get Caught With Your Pantry Down. <laughs> that, um, I think that the pandemic really has caught, and I'm not going to use the word public school, but I'll use the word government schools, because that's really what they are. 
I think they've really caught government schools with their pantry down. Mm -hmm. And I think that now that we are, and to your Sekou's point, we are at a point, a very turning, a big turning point, where we have to rethink everything spanning from uh, different methods of teacher certification, because I think that there's value in the work that parents are doing with their children. And we really need to rethink the role that parents play uh, as, as the first educators of their children. And there are a host of issues that have come out of the pandemic that have really kind, they were existing, they were kind of simmering on the landscape, but uh, key to those conversations are really conversations around accountability. Uh, it makes my head spin when I look at the data on uh, failing schools, excuse me, failing government schools, uh, and particularly in rural towns like rural Georgia, where families don't have a lot of options, mm -hmm. that makes my head spin because it's, it's akin to living in a town where you have one doctor that can perform the services that you need. And that one doctor has been getting F's and D's over a span of three to 12 years. Then where does that leave a family or a person who's seeking that kind of help? And so I think the question of accountability has really come up and we have to think about how do we address uh, government schools not providing the needs of our, our black and brown children in particular, but certainly the broader population. We talked about broadband challenges and uh, it really, um, again, doubles up when you're in rural towns because in rural towns, once again, when you have a single broadband provider, then of course the likes of you know customer quality and, and price really come into play. And so poor counties are really getting double whammy uh, when they don't have access to high quality providers in that space. Um, and then there's a whole of other things that really the pandemic has really highlighted and this whole uh, over criminalization of black and brown kids. Uh, and you and I, we've all seen in the news um, where black and brown children are being, and as you know, I shared earlier, I'm from Michigan. Uh, in May, there was a judge that did a ruling of a brown girl who didn't turn in her homework online to be sent to juvenile justice detention. That's pretty scary. Uh, and so again, uh, when you know America catches a cold, black and brown children who are attending government schools will get the flu for sure. I think that might get us into uh, policy territory, but I want to pull back. So uh, Curtis, I'll come to you soon, um, but I, I want to check in with Dr. Clarity right now. The majority of Black families, for better or worse, are interacting with regular traditional district schools to get their main service right now. There's a lot of conversation nationally about what type of expansive reforms we might try and, you know, uh, pods and different things we might do. But the reality is that most black families right now are engaged with the school district in one way or another, either through hybrid learning, full day learning, in person, partial, you know, two days and then not and, and that. How are you guys thinking about this from your school district and what you see on the ground in a real more list, realistic view? How are you all thinking about keeping track of students, making sure they're all engaged in online and getting the education that they need? What's the realistic challenge that you see families having? <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you for the question, Chris. Uh, I represent the Madison Metropolitan School District in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, it's the capital city of uh, Wisconsin. And uh, to your point, we are, the pandemic has really placed a magnifying glass on systems that were already designed to marginalize. Uh, and you see that often in terms of, as, as we talk about internet access, we're also talking about, look at that from a uh, race and social economic aspect around who has to go to, who has to go to work or who's uh, considered to be uh, a critical provider and who is able to stay home and support their uh, children in the in a virtual environment. Speaking both as a educator, as a chief of schools for Mass Metropolitan and as well as a parent of three, I have uh, two 17 year olds and a 15 year old that are experiencing uh, virtual uh, instruction mm -hmm. in my own house. So I'm surprised I bandwidth right now, honestly. All three, <laughs> three of them on. Um, the and what I'm noticing is that their experience is actually a microcosm of of kind of what you see in society. I have one that's excelling in it. Uh, that the new way of learning has is just really caught on. I have one that's is going to do it because she's supposed to and I have one that absolutely hates it. Uh, mm -hmm. and is like very uh, is like terrified of of what her experience will, will be. What we've tried to do, what we are doing in our in our system, is really focusing on the, on the acceleration, knowing that if we don't accelerate 
uh, both in the social emotional support, uh, uh, accelerated and academic support, and making sure that every detail up into including even motor skills, you know, we take for granted the opportunity for a child to hold a pencil or a pen and those things that are that are, that inevitably happen in the classroom all the time if you and don't necessarily happen across the screen unless you're intentional about doing so. And so we're really partnering with families to identify that and call that out and say, you know, it's really intentionally reaching out to those that we know have been traditionally marginalized and say, you know, we're going to you first. And we're we're asking about your experiences first. We're asking what you need first. Uh, and we're going to privilege you. Uh, mm -hmm. And that, that has been a, our mindset um, in making sure that we do not continue to perpetuate gaps and that we actually close the gaps along the way. We have no intention to return to, a, to normal because normal was not normal meant marginalization. So we are creating a new norm um, through, through these types of practices. Yeah, and Curtis, um, you would be a great to chime in on this. I mean, you've seen this from a school board level. You've seen it from a public policy level, not just local, but local and national. Um, my family is, you know, to uh, to Dr. Clarity's best work. Uh, I know what our district is not working out well. My family needs some relief. Um, what do you got for us, Curtis? Are you coming with some policies that can enable us to educate well, our kids more? Well, I... I know you're from the great state of Minnesota and, you know, Dennis Green, a famous football coach, yes. uh, famous for saying, we, they are who we thought they were, or we are who we, who they thought that we were, which is, it's a reveal. I think mm -hmm. this is very revealing mm -hmm. to the world. I think within our communities, we knew a lot of this. Uh, and oftentimes it takes something like this for other people to catch on. Uh, Dr. Clardy mentioned the idea that he has three children. And three of them come to this space very differently. I, similarly, I have two children, a 12-year-old and a 10-year-old. Uh, and in many ways, my 12-year-old my is excelling, doing better probably than he was in, in the school building. Uh, my 10-year-old, who's quite, honestly more of a gifted and talented student, um, is, is, is doing it because, you know, kicking and screaming. Mm -hmm. But we always knew that children were different. We always knew that we needed diversity in, in, in how we went about going to we always knew that there were families in our school districts uh, that um, were uh, vulnerable. Uh, we, we knew that our systems were, um, in, you know, um, unequally funded and, you know, and were not distributing fun funds that we did have equitably. And so I think this is just sort of pulling the, the cover over, you know, from, from, from over something that we've been sweeping under the rug um, for, uh, you know, people wouldn't say maybe just a couple of years. This is, this is generational. Uh, and is re revealing to the country what was happening in education. This is, again, part of a, a larger conversation we're having about our country uh, that is revealing to, to us and to the world that a lot of what we thought this country stood for doesn't really stand for at all. Uh, mm -hmm. I think also mm -hmm. people within our community, people who we thought were on board with us, um, we thought were our allies in a lot of this, um, I think really showed themselves to be um, uh, folks who were not in support of really self-determination, uh, really having, you know, black and brown parents choose what's best for their children. And so for me, it's really revealing um, uh, to the world, but I think for the five of us, uh, it's just something that we always knew was there. Um, now, as far as, you know, where we go from here, I think now that it's on the table, um, now, that, now that the world is seeing, you know, what a lot of other parents um, have been going through, um, parents who are not from our community are, are again, even within, you know, certain other communities are struggling to, to find proper education, to have an education that meets the needs of their children, uh, that hopefully uh, as, a, as a country uh, will bring the full resources to a, a address this because uh, everyone's watching. So for any of you all and all that, uh, I just want to say, Curtis, you got away from me. You didn't ask, you didn't bring me any relief. You told me, you told me what the problem is again, but you didn't bring my family any relief and this is very personal. So what I'm, what I want to push on a little bit is, and I'm, you know, I'm joking here, but what I want to push on a little bit is what should, what should we be demanding from our leaders? Like, wh what are the things, what are the concrete items we should be telling them? No, we need you to deliver right now. What are the things we should be demanding from policymakers, decision makers, local and national? You know, Chris, I'll, I'll try to take a stab at that one, uh, just because, again, uh, I, too, am a parent of a 14-year-old who we are actually homeschooling. So, I, 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 and, and I think about that in terms of, um, you know, what should we be demanding? And, and I, if, if I may, 
let me answer that from the lens and the role that I play as a homeschool mom. And I know that your listening audience are prom predominantly have students who are in government schools, but I think that post COVID that there may be, uh, there has been a growth of African American families who will choose to school their kids at home. But one of the things that I can think about uh, that, that would help our family uh, to be able to provide the services that we need for our 14 year old who's home is we have to rethink how government schools are funded. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a mm -hmm. big question regarding uh, the fact that those property tax dollars go to fund government schools that some families may not have children in. And in fact, uh, to, to your point, Curtis, now that the vast majority of Americans are schooling their kids at home, I think everybody's asking the funding question now because, you know, they're saying, okay, well, if I'm teaching my child at home, what are we paying teachers for, right? Or, um, you know, if the dollars are going to our school and my kid doesn't show up, how can those dollars come back to families? And I know I apologize. It, it may be, again, selfish of me to think that way. But again, if there's going to be a growth of families who will, may, or, or may not choose to, to school at home, I think that we need to ask policymakers and decision makers to rethink how government schools are funded. And mm -hmm. if parents are the first uh, educators of their children, I think that it will be awesome if there's a formula where those, some of those property tax dollars comes back to families so that they can use that for curriculum purchases, for tutors, and for all the, the whole the gamut of resources that they may need for their children. And even absent homeschooling, I think that any parent, you, you're homeschooling, I mean, you're schooling your children at home right now, by golly, for the five, past four or five months or six months that you've been doing so, it would have been nice to be able to use those dollars to find a tutor in your area to help with the work, to give you some relief as you, as you alluded to. Yeah, and I think, um... So I have three at home right now. And if you think about it, like if, if we were thinking about the average in Minnesota being 16,000 per kid, that their headcount is generating for my district, the district that isn't really educating them right now, um, you know, uh, you get almost, you get close to 50K. And I have no control over that 50K, but I have control over the kids every day. They're upstairs right now pretending like they're learning something uh, and they're not. <laughs> um, so uh, I would love anybody to start demanding that families have some control over that because the one thing we are figuring out is resources matter. It matters, right? If you're not going to like be a quant and sit with your kid at the, the table and teach math or whatnot, you can get a tutor to help with math but it, it requires resources to make that happen. Um, I did wanna kick back to, to Curtis and just ask a question around policy. Just in normal times, we would be talking about things like charter schools and teacher evaluation and just like the whole host of like regular normal reform issues and then COVID comes along. Are all those things like off the table and out the door and now we really do need to shift to like how we resource families and households or do we try and chew gum and walk at the same time, do those policies and new policies? Well, I mean, I, I, I think where, where, Segu, uh, where Seku started, um, I think is, is, uh, is a precursor to where we're going. I would say in my school district here in Prince George's County, Maryland, we're looking at budget cuts coming. And so in many ways, it's, it's, it's going to be even more challenging um, because of uh, lower yeah. revenues um, and um, additional funds needed to really equip our schools for students to, to, to come back. And so uh, there'll be potential furloughs, uh, there'll be other cuts to programs. And in many ways, innovation is always sort of the, the, the first on the chopping block. Uh, and so people kind of go back to uh, what they've all, what they're sort of comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And so when I think about what we're thinking about moving forward, I mean, I mean to, to be perfectly honest, uh, folks are just trying to hold on and they're really treading water, uh, looking for relief. Uh, and like a lot of things, you know, my perspective, in policy, but also as a community organizer, um, you know, I'm, you know, in the words of you know Barack Obama, we are the ones we've been waiting for, and so a lot of folks like 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 Dr. Mons is and, and you know is talking about others are saying you know how do I take full control of my child's education in a way that I've never have, and in, in, in a way that I sort of ceded to 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 government schools, and 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 now that I'm doing it not by choice per se, but as necessity. Um, I'm learning. And so, you know, parents have learned a lot um, about educating their child, learned about, about how their child learns, about how their child, what their child excels at, what their child struggles at. And so I, I think the one thing coming out of this for parents 
I think they're better equipped to advocate to school board members like myself around this thing. What I've said as a, as a member, and I, I had a conversation with our with our superintendent uh, not long ago. I said, you know, it's you have to hire a futurist on your staff full time, who's looking at what 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 are schools going to look like in five or ten years, and right now be preparing for that. And so here's one example. Right now in Prince George's County, we're going through a, 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 a pre um, you know, create this endeavor to uh, do P3 partnerships to, to build schools. We have, you know, half of our schools are, are dilapidated. And I'm saying, well, as we're building schools, these are 30 year schools. You're not going to tell me our kids are going to be learning the same way in 30 years that they're learning now. So we can't build a school that's going to be around 30 years with a bunch of classrooms that are going to fit 30 kids with a chalkboard and a, and a person standing at the, at, at the, at the front. We are not going to go back to Doc's point to where we were. Uh, I think parents are going to demand, even parents who go back into the school, a, a, a hybrid model where maybe children go in every other day, may, maybe they go in only when needed, maybe they have sort of a tutorial model where you do have a more efficient way of allocating resources. Um, and so, but if, but if, if superintendents and school board and, 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 and advocacy groups aren't pushing leaders to be more innovative now, in five years from now, we'll be having these, these same conversations. And lastly, when you think about the 100 Black men and, and folks who are listening in here, we have to have a plan that when we go out to community partners who come in and say, you know, Dr. Dr. Chris Stewart, Superintendent Clardy, you know, all those folks, how can 100 Black men be helpful? If you don't have a strategy or a plan for what the world's going to look like, you're not going to be able to allocate, you know, their support and, 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 and sort of use their resources when they come and say, we just want to help you young young black and brown uh, young men and women, but you all don't have a plan to how to, you know, how to utilize our resources, you know, that's going to be a lot, a, a, a lot left on the table. And so it has to be a strategy, but also mm -hmm. how we look around the corner, but also how parents are better equipped to advocate uh, because they're more educated now than ever about how their children learn and how systems should be supporting their children. So Sekou, um, I want to ask you a question about this because yeah. uh, Curtis and I have talked about this before and I keep bringing it up, we have a lot of organizations like 100 Black Men, um, the Urban League, UNCF, um, the NAACP, fraternities and sororities, Jack and Jill. Like Black people are rich with organizations and networks that have staff, infrastructure, budgets. Is there a role for them to play right now in making sure that 8 million Black children are being educated? Uh, so and, oh, and families being supported. I should yeah, add, yeah, add that yeah, too. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the short answer is uh, is yes, right? And and part of it is so I'll, I'll take where I am right now, UNCF, as an example. So if you think about sort of the historic significance and impact of HBCUs in America, right? Like HBCUs for more than 150 years have been educating young people who, let's be honest, like for most of their existence. HBCU has been educating students that other institutions refuse to admit, right? Like not, you know, not, we can't like refuse to allow them in the building. And, you know, and HBCUs have really been, you know, an example of like the engine that has built a black middle class in this country, right? That has over and over and over again, like may helped communities make a way out of no way. And, you know, still to this date, like our, our, consistently under-resourced, and yet when you look at outcomes for HBCU graduates, like they consistently outperform black college graduates in general. So there's clearly a lot there. I think one of the challenges we have as a society is for all the things HBCUs have delivered to American society, like the country has not, you know, and this goes back to some of the comments I've made about like the legacy of racism, this country has not valued what those institutions have done for the country, let alone the people that's been serving. And I think we, we, have, to, we have to get into that. Um, but I think, you know, part of it, Chris, is also, you know, how do we as black people and black institutions also push harder? And I think in some ways, uh, this may come across as contrarian, but I think that there's, there's actually some simplicity to the, to the path forward here. Mm -hmm. that people tend to find a way around, right? Like, I'm not a big believer in that our answers to all of our problems are necessarily super complicated, you know, crystal ball. Like, a lot of this is real simple. Like, one thing is, we just have to be really clear with everybody that we're not interested in hearing any plan or any path forward 
that does not like acknowledge at the outset. So I think sort of like uh, what Dr. Clar Clarity was saying earlier, like that doesn't start from a place of like, we're about equity and this is what that means. Because like, if you're not committed to that from go, then why are we trying to do something together? Like, cause this is like the history of our existence in this country, right? Which is that institutions have left us out over and over and over again. And every time we think we're in the conversation and we're gonna get something, we get left out in the cold, right? And so like, we gotta get clear and tight on like, this has gotta be about how the path forward is built around equity for our people, our children, our communities. And I think, you know, to do that, we have to do some things like call out the challenges around, you know, we're not like actively engaged in using democracy and managing the system the way it's designed to work, right? We have, you know, you see people, I mean, turnout yesterday was an anomaly, but like that's actually a problem in and of itself, right? Like people have opted out of, right? They pay taxes and then don't vote. Like it doesn't work that way. And there's a reason why you travel around, you know, communities around the country and there's direct correlations between voter turnout and quality of life in those communities. And we've got to help people understand like, that's part of what you need to do. Um, but I think we also have to like be smarter about this. I mean, I think there are a lot of things people know and things that people think they know about the way public education or education in general works. Mm -hmm. The funding one is, is a classic example of education is a hyper local issue. And it is in fact the case that in most communities, the nuances around how it's governed, financed, and managed in your community will not well apply to my community. And so we've got to be careful about when we have conversations across communities and nationally, that people who are listening are taking lessons to apply to where they live that don't apply to where they live. And we're not being clear about that. So people are walking away thinking, oh, I know what to do, only what they think they know doesn't yeah, well, let me, let me challenge that just a little bit and to say the most local you can possibly get is a family. Yeah. Like if you were to look at all the levels, the family level is the most local you could possibly get when it comes to governing the life of a child. And I think our families in Detroit and in Oakland and in the Twin Cities and in D.C. are having some pretty similar situations when it comes down to that level of challenge, like the family level of challenge. So the way schools and, and are funded district rules and all those, you're right. There are 14,000 school districts. All of their rules are going to be a little bit different. Most yeah. of them are grasping for straws right now on how they're going to educate kids. Yeah. But I, I keep coming back to how do we get resources to families that for the first time in our lifetime, the government has said, here are your kids back. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Have at her. Like we used to do this all day long and you have parents now who are like, for real? Yeah, yeah. Like they, they're going to be here with me all day. Like, yeah. what am I? Right. And the very thing, first thing you figure out is that parents across races, uh, different races and, and geographies are experiencing that. But some have resources to start developing micro schools or to start developing education collaboratives where they're working with each, with each other. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. definitely are, are creating systems of alternative education so like yeah. like soft systems like hiring a tutor finding a person a phd candidate who can come and teach kids three days a week right. as a as a part-time job but for black folks oftentimes because the resources aren't there we get left out of the innovation train as it's taking off and then we become an afterthought and because where i started with this question was because we have all these institutions we we have institutions I'm wondering if we need to be putting pressure on them and our leaders to do something very specific around making sure we get resources directly to families. I, I think that's true. Although I'm gonna push on, I don't know that the call for resources for families is really a school thing. I think that, I think that we have largely mm. missed the idea that most communities don't have like an intelligent and like effective methodology around how we invest in the development of children to put them on a path to success as adults, right? So you think about what you see in communities and what you see in your networks, right? Like middle class and above families basically do a calculus around what's the right or good enough school thing for me. And then they set about constructing an entire ecosystem around their child that supports their overall development and success. So like, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, what's mm -hmm. happening now for a lot of those families is a bump in the road because the rest of the ecosystem 
is largely intact. So they move some pieces around and things are working. And like, like for my kids, like my son's upstairs right now. I think they don't have class this afternoon, but like he's here working most days, engaged with teachers online. That's working for my household. Mm. But I also know like when there are technical issues, I can be tech support. Like there's a bunch of, there are a lot of people who can't be sitting in the house working, getting up to go engage with their kid. And I don't know that that's the school's issue to solve. I think that that's like our city, county, other government agencies. And to your question, like other community groups to say, we know like none of this is new, right? The imbalance and so the lack of resources around families and around communities have been here. And we've simply pretended they weren't real issues. And now COVID has accelerated and magnified everything. And it's like, you know, we metaphors today, like, COVID is like the great example of the like, you don't know who's skinny dip until the tide goes out. The tide went way out and we found out we're at the nude beach all of a sudden. It's like, well, you know. Okay, well, let's not think too much about that. <laughs> so what I will say on that note um, well, is well, that we have- I was gonna say, but- So Curtis, you were talking about building more schools. We also have a homeschool expert on this panel. I think we're vacillating between whether learning is the thing or whether school is the thing. Um, help me out with that, both of you. Curtis, starting with you. I mean, help me out with the, should it be about schools and school and the public system and all that? Well, I mean, you mentioned 14,000, 15,000 school districts, all with school boards. Um, And I I believe, you know, Seku mentioned how how different, you know, at least funding. But there is one thing they all all have in common. They are incredibly bureaucratic um, and incredibly top heavy. And I think these, you know, you you quote $16,000 per student. Most folks on this call will know that about 75% of that is going to go to personnel. Um, and that's going to go to personnel. It's going to go to pensions. And so uh, unless you're going to stop paying teachers altogether, um, which would throw the economy in a, in, you know, in a, in a tailspin, um, then we're not going to have that conversation because only about 25% of it is actually going to um, anything outside of, you know, actual human, human resource development. And so this idea of, uh, you know, what we, how we run school systems is something that I think in, in, in my space at Reinventing America School is something we concentrate on. And, and the work that I do with sitting with school board members and with superintendents around the country is how do we unleash the power of the parent and the power of the teacher? And in, 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 the, you know, in, in my wife's case, who's a, who's a school principal, how do you unleash the innovation um, and ingenuity of school principals who if given the freedom, a school teacher, if given the freedom, a parent is given the freedom, could really, you know, move uh, our, our children to a level that bureaucracies um, and sort of these top down, um, s- super, you know, uh, you know, um, systems that are really put in to sort of catch people or to in many ways expect the worst of people. Um, and, and then sort of, you know, all the policies that go into it. And then for those who uh, do things well, we sort of say, okay, I'm, I'm sorry to put this in place, but this is sort of just to ensure that we hold folks accountable. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, 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 and so this idea, I was, you know, listening to James Baldwin um, recently, he got interviewed around the government and, you know, what, what should the federal government, what, what do you expect from the federal government? And he says, you know, if the federal government would just leave black people alone, we would do, it, it, it would be amazing because mm-hmm. everything you think you do for us, a lot of what you do hurts. You do more hurt than good in a lot of ways. <laughs> and all the policies and all the policies that came up in, 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 in the name of trying to do good by black people destroyed a lot of the, um, the businesses. You know, we could talk about, you know, the implications of, 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 of even Brown v. Board of Education and, 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 and sort of the unintended consequences of those things. We could talk about all the things that destroyed Black Wall Street in Tulsa. We could talk a lot about, you know, all those things that I think if in many ways, you know, government to some degree left black people alone to their own devices of ingenuity and connections and community partnerships and, and how we identify supports for our children, that we could do a lot more than I think people truly understand. Uh, and I think right now where our government is nationally, I think people are thinking now, they're turning about education, but also about small business, about transportation, about social justice that says, you know what, I think in the end, we're kind of on our own out here. And it mm-hmm. took us a while to sort of be untethered from the role of these institutions. And so if, you know, regardless of what happens in this election, one thing that we will understand is 
we have to start making decisions for ourselves and look inward um, as opposed to outward and conversations like this with groups like 100 Black Men are mm -hmm. places to start. And if I can make a few comments, and I think you're spot on. Um, so, so the first thing that comes to mind really is from uh, trying to reflect on the comments that Sekou made regarding, um, you know, the role of groups and organizations within our, within our communities. I think as I, I think through um, the work that has to be done now, it's those organizations really need to, to really roll their sleeves up and come to the aid of communities. And I think that one of the unintended consequences of compulsory education in America is that I, it, it's given families and parents this understanding that, to, to your point, Curtis, you know, the government schools, we're, we're all good, we're taken care of, and post-COVID is a rude awakening that, oh, by the way, mm -hmm. maybe we weren't. And so I think that there's, there's certainly a role and an important conversation around community and really understanding kind of grassroots resources that we have at our reach. Uh, there was a, a discussion regarding this notion of innovation and schools being more innovative. Well, I have to be honest with you, we don't rethink like teacher certification and teacher preparation. All we're doing is we're just reinventing and we're gonna rehash the same kinds of challenges that we're dealing with now. Because if we don't get innovative thinkers into these teacher prep programs at the undergraduate level and prepare them for what could happen 30, 40, 50 years downstream, then we're just gonna get a repeat of this kind of the challenges that we see. I think another thing that, that came up in the discussion is really around funding and how we should rethink mm -hmm. funding. Mm -hmm. um, and you all know there's studies that say most of those dollars are going to non-teaching staff, right? So the work of uh, Ben Scafferty at Kennesaw State has done quite a bit of research around just funding models and where the money is really going. So I don't, I don't know. I, I think, again, that we don't give parents enough credit. I think that parents now post pandemic are saying to themselves, wow, I thought my child was further along than he or she is. And oh my goodness, this is, this is interesting, sad, but I've got to do something about it. Um, but to your point too, Curtis, you mentioned if if, if the government would just get out of black people's way, we would be fine. But I would kind of add one other caveat to that is if we can also release and eliminate the regulations that exist, because you know they can get out of the way in terms of saying compulsory education, okay, go ahead, do your thing. But if there are, gate, are there gatekeepers and there are laws and regulations that prevent parents from teaching their children, like you all have read the work of Elizabeth Bartley at Harvard who came out with the article, then it really puts a, a greater onus on parents who do want to do right by their children, but unfortunately, there may be regulations that also serve as barriers to doing so. Yeah, I feel like I'm a, uh, beating a dead horse when I talk about like, you know, the hundred and I want to say it's $150 billion that is actually generated for public education specifically for the 8 million black children, right? Just for the black kids. And if you can give 8 million black kids access to some power over that $150 billion, what would be possible? And that's why I go to some of our organizations, 100 Black Men, our uh, HBCUs and others, to think what would the educated class of our people who study education all the time say that could be done with that money if it were put in, in, you know, into the hands of local people. I also would want to ask the very realistic question, are we ready for that type of um, relationship with government where they say, we are going to give you out and get out of your way here. Here's your money. Go make something happen. And... I would raise a well, question, you know, are we ready? Chris, 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 there are five people on this panel, right? Yeah. Three of us attended, attended schools in Atlanta, Spelman and Morehouse, Sekou and, and Dr. Mond, private historically black colleges mm -hmm. that get for government mm -hmm. funding for education. We, we have a conversation about that. But we show Morehouse, Morehouse if, if someone went to Morehouse as president and said, would you all rather be a public institution or rather, would you rather have the freedom in order to create a unique learning environment, particularly for black men and Spelman similarly for black women. But do you also believe that the government has some role in playing that those who've been paying taxes for the first 18 years of their life deserve uh, resources similar to anybody from the University of Georgia, University of Maryland, or anyone else? I think we would say that. But at the same time, we do have our schools, particularly private HBCUs, that struggle. And that's why UNCF is so important because there's tons of students who thrive in that environment that we know are going to go off and change the world. But let's, if UNCF wasn't around, there would be tens of thousands of students 
who would be in schools that are not serving in. I don't know where I'd be without Morehouse. This is a mm -hmm. confession. Mm -hmm. I don't know mm -hmm. where I'd be. I'd, I'd be in a tall grass. But that institution was the was a sort of a byproduct of, and this is you know I have a conversation all the time about Rosenwald schools, Chris. A lot of these schools, Morehouse and Spelman, started as glorified high schools, and we and we romanticize these schools. They didn't start really giving out bachelor's degrees until about 20 or 30 years after they were started. And, you know, mm -hmm. talking about this, they were kind of glorified charter schools, people coming together, getting a little bit of government funding, you know, a portion of it, but folks coming together with their own resources, working with the faith community, uh, working with uh, other institutions to come together and fund these schools and with all the freedom. And so, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I've said this publicly. Well, you're, I'm, I'm you're, you're, you know, you're begging everything. the question for me now, uh, Curtis, you're begging the question for me again, though. Why aren't we seeing that happen now? We have these institutions, we have families in need, we have a broken K-12 system that can't get its pants on in the morning. We have 8 million kids generating about 850, or 100, I'm sorry, $50 billion annually. And I can't understand why there isn't a K-12 Morehouse, or why there isn't a K-12 Spelman or whether there isn't a Spelman High School or a system of them. Uh, Dr. Cardi, I see you raising your hand. I actually want to throw this to you too in a, in a way because um, you're in Madison, very progressive, very white area, which is, the, is where a lot of our black kids are in these cities where you have municipal governments that are very progressive, um, very white, and they don't have an HBCU nearby or a cultural option nearby, but they're still getting paid to, to educate our kids every day and educate in air quotes. Um, and those families have been calling out for help for, for a long period of time. Um, what can our institutions do to actually create the, new, the next thing? There's multiple layers to that. And just to be transparent about Madison, Wisconsin, yes, it is quote unquote liberal, um, but the actions don't match the liberal title when it comes to uh, disproportionate outcomes for our, for our families and students. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, the Wisconsin in itself, as you know, uh, and Dane County, where Madison is the number one disproportionate in the country for outcomes for African-American students. And so I, that's why I take it as a part of my responsibility and those I work with to dismantle those systems that are causing that. I really raised my hand initially because as you were talking about the funding sources, you know, is ironic, not in a funny sense, but an ironic in our sense of, of transitions that we are an educational institution in K-12, but we don't have a class or even the content that actually teaches school funding to the very students that, mm -hmm. were, wow. that, that, were, that were teaching. But there's not one course around school, school funding and school systems. And what, when that occurs and you're not teaching that with intentionality around, you know, what should this school design be doing for me and my and my family then it leaves it up to someone to make that decision for you and that's where opportunity hoarding continues to exist and resonate throughout 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 the community uh be very frank the you know, we the 100 100 black men of madison is a very strong very supportive organization and provides a tremendous amount of resources and, and like actual physical resources as well as the resource of knowledge. And that's where we find our, our, best, our best partnership is that it's not we're gonna go in and do mentoring, tutoring, and just provide reading for reading's sake. It's literacy for the purpose of understanding how do I recognize uh, items that are, that are historically inaccurate? How do I recognize items that are not conducive to actually me being a, a civil servant and being able to know, understand my voting rights in, in, in the future? And so it's literacy, but it's also a literacy for a, for a purpose. And we're doing that at the very early ages um, in, in, early, in early childhood and all the way through, through our middle schools. I also want to talk to, uh, as, you, as you think about what the, what the partnerships really, really, really exist, and I, and I want to circle back to historically inaccurate uh, materials in front of our students. If you, Without the support of organizations that are bringing additional resources in, you would swear that we as an education, that our history as black people was, you know, a ship showed up in Africa, we got our bus kicked for 400 years, and then Dr. Martin Luther King showed up and all was good. And that is, could be the farthest from our, our existence on, on this planet and what we, what we presented to, uh, what we provide to society. So 
it's, it's all those underlying issues about the integrity of self and the sense of self and my sense of belonging uh, in, in the organization uh, and what that means for, for me. Um, but I'll be very transparent. We have no intention of liberalizing our kids right back into a situation of poverty all over again. And so that is why we are, you know, we, we work to, to dismantle those systems to recognize when opportunity hoarding is occurring because we all can, we can reach out for more funding, more funding, more funding. But if it goes right back to opportunities that are not in support of those that need it most, then the, what, what the sense of the funding sources mean? I mean, if, if we don't under, undermine the opportunity hoarding that, that exists in front of it. So, you know, I think it's really about how do you identify and then mostly not just identify, how do you react to it within your own, own organization and own it? Uh, and own it means being able to partner with your with your board of education, be an important partner with those around you, and be able to prepare your board of education to know that you're going to have a lot of coded language coming back. It's never that we're too anti-racist. It's always coded as something different. And how do you work mm-hmm. board to understand what are they really listening to when you're truly dismantling uh, the these systems? So it's mul- multiple layers to that. Well, I can answer what they're listening to. They are shopping online as they're doing school board meetings, just so you know. Uh, um, so I could tell you, that's an easy answer for me on that one. Um, but I have a question for all of you all. Before COVID, we would have been having a conversation about choice and choice policies, and that would have taken a very predictable path. That conversation, you could probably all predict what that, what that sounds like, the, the pro and con. Uh, how's that changed now? What's the difference now that we have kids at home with parents? How's it changed this policy conversation that we've been having anyways around choice and what choices uh, folks should have? And and is it good or bad? Well, I mean, I would say I think this is for some parents, the first time they've done some comparison shopping um, mm-hmm. around, you know, what other options are available. So for those parents who had the resources to pivot to a private um, environment, you know, I think for the first time they're seeing, you know, was it all that I thought it was or, mm. um, or, or wow, this is what I missed out on. Uh, I think those who may have pivoted more to a, a home, a more traditional homeschool, um, in my, in, in a prior life, I worked with connections education, um, and some, some have pivoted sort of the K-12 connections education, which is still a public school in most, in, in the states that they're, they're in. And so I think when you're in this com- comparison shopping space, um, I think it will, when people come back, uh, look back and say, um, was what I had uh, the best? I think also, mm-hmm. quickly, folks in my space, looking at how certain types of schools responded and, and again, how their, whether bureaucracy, bureaucracy or not, allowed them to respond and pivot in the March, April closure time to get resources out quickly, to respond, to put in training for teachers, as Dr. Mons mentioned. You know, their ability to respond in, with speed and with precision, um, and there's been studies that showed how different types of schools, private, um, charter, traditional, mm-hmm. public, were able to uh, respond. I think that's also another comparison shopping tool. I think prior to all this, we were all sort of baked in, and I'll speak personally, my children are going to go to traditional public school. We're going to, you know, try like hell to get them into the best, you know, competitive schools in the district, and then we're also going to do everything that that black parents do, read to our children, take them to museums, put them around really, really, you know, um, forward thinking, thinking people, other children like them, and then pray, right? I, I think, you know, I mean, I mean honestly, and then and, 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 and pray. I think now people are saying, well, you know what? There, there are other options. I think I maybe didn't have to work as hard as I thought, or maybe mm-hmm. um, there are things that I thought were there that I, I probably should have been working harder on. And so again, this is still a, the great reveal um, that I think uh, people are going to come out of. But to your point, I, I see you pushing on this, uh, Chris. Mm. If we come out of this and we're in some ways behind where we were when we started, because you're saying, Curtis, if, if panel, we were, move, we were having this conversation. We put pause on it. We're going to, you know, we're gonna, we'll, we may not get back to for another six, maybe nine months. And if we mm-hmm. come back out of it and we're not having the conversations that we had before, you know, it, it wasn't a loss. I was. I agree with you 100%. It would have been a tremendous uh, missed opportunity for us. Uh, but I think having people like, you know, having conversations like this with groups like 100 Black men that have tentacles in, you know, every major urban mm-hmm. area in the in the country mm-hmm. is, is 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 where it starts. Because in many ways, it really can't it really can't come from us. I mean, this is sort of kind of thinking about strategy. You really need 100 Black men and National Urban League presidents to really be the mouthpiece. And have us kind of like standing behind and saying, you know what, whatever you need, I got you. 
but it has to come from you, president, you know, affiliate president in, of National Urban League, you know, NAACP president that are more progressive, Hunter Blackman president. We need you leaning forward demanding, and we will give you cover. We'll give you all the research you need. We'll give you all the, all the connections to the right people in the, um, at the right doors to knock on. We'll, we'll, we'll have better conversations about how you should be, you know, talking about these things. But if we're kind of like the folks who've been doing this for a long time, leading the way years from now, I would have said we, we missed an opportunity uh, and that we would not be nearly as far as we, where we need to be if we don't have those community leaders um, uh, leading the way and, and really being the mouthpiece um, for a lot of this conversation. So, Hunter Black men, people who are leaders who are listening, this is your opportunity not to sort of be supportive to the district, but to lead. Well, and, and, and um, I think that should be a thing we demand of our leaders. Like when I, going back to what I said earlier, is that our organizations that represent us, we have strength, we have power. There are power in the, in the networks. Those networks represent power. I posit to you all, and I don't know what you would say about this, but those groups of folks that I said earlier, if they were all to meet for a weekend and have a retreat and come up with a blueprint for black education, they would be unstoppable right? That, 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 that number of actors that I said, if we could just get them in a retreat somewhere and they come back with a blueprint for black power and a demand for a price tag on what that blueprint is supposed to cause, uh, cost, it's done. I think, I, I, I honestly believe that. Dr. Mons, I know you had your hand up. Uh, yeah, I want to skim, skim by you. Of spot on. I, you know, Curtis, the only thing I, I certainly would disagree with what you said is I don't think that moving forward, we should go back to business as usual. In fact, to your point, Chris, I think that it, it, it is imperative that the organizations and the powers that be, those of us that are in the sororities and the fraternities and the organizations, we really have get, got to sit down and put our heads together. And one of the things I certainly would agree with you on, Chris, is really trying to rethink even teacher preparation and teacher certification. HBCUs are the highest producers of teachers of color. Not only are the courses that you mentioned absent from these preparatory programs, but no one's talking about the entrepreneurship of schools. How do you mm -hmm, start open a mm -hmm. school? I don't know a single curriculum that says that in, a, in an undergraduate teacher prep program that's called how to open your own school, okay? <laughs> um, we need programs like that. Another thing I think that really ties us at the hip is really this, I don't think there's a single class in a teacher prep program entitled, teach, how do we teach parents how to teach their own kids? Nobody's talking about parents and providing them with the resources they need. And another thing is really this question of accreditation. You know, Chris, you asked a very important question. Why aren't we doing it? Why aren't we having our own schools? And because in my mind, I'm thinking HBCUs and teacher prep programs, the way they currently are set up, they're just feeder systems to government schools. They're just mm -hmm. feeder systems to government schools. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like a you know, a script on how to go work in government schools. Nobody's talking about innovation. No one's talking about entrepreneurship. And then we look at charter schools, like there's some, you know, anomaly, like, oh, I want my charter school to look like that. I'm like, excuse me, what does it take to make it happen? But when you have accrediting bodies that uh, set up structures that say, teacher prep programs must meet these kinds of standards. And then once a teacher gets into the field, they have to meet those kinds of standards. Then we start really looking at those undergirding challenges that people of color are thinking, okay, how do we fight through the weeds of accreditation? How do we fight through the weeds of regulation? But I'm to the mindset, and I know it may be crystal ball, but I'm like you, Chris, your question is certainly spot on. If we just simply sit around, let the dust settle, and put our kids back in government schools and cross our fingers and, and pray to God that it works, shame on us. And shame on us, especially those of us who are in positions that can roll our sleeves up and be courageous. Because I think that the courage is really being able to rethink education altogether. Because you know the government is in the business of making money. And unfortunately, we're investing in government schools and there is no return on investment for black and brown kids. And yeah, we continue no, to send our kids to those same schools. Well, anybody who has add, watched me for any amount of time has heard me say, I think that black kids are the new cotton and everybody wants to harvest them for their per pupil income. And we care about the body, but we don't care about the mind. So the system wants to keep the body in the system. Um, but you hit on something and uh, Curtis, I'll come right to you. Um, but, but uh, you just hit on something I think is very important. One of those questions we would ask that comes out of a smart panel like this is, 
what is a teacher? Like this would be a good time to rethink what is a teacher? Where do they come from? How do they come about? Why, how are they, are, are you still a teacher if nobody's learning? Right? Like this would be oh. a good time to start asking those questions. Like, are you still a teacher if nobody's learning? Um, but Curtis, I want to come to Curtis and then I'll come to you. So um, um, really, Sekou. really quickly, yeah. really quickly. And I, and I like to, so I just want to say that Morehouse does have a class, a uh, guy named Artesius Miller, um, who is executive director of Utopian Charter Schools in Clayton County, Georgia, has a class at Morehouse right now on how to build a school. Mm, um, well, and I, and, and, and I, I have a, a mentee who's there who went to Morehouse to be a mathematician, was going to do a 3-2 program in Georgia Tech, and called me and said, I think I want to get an education. I said, oh, you want to be a school teacher? He said, no. He said, I want to help build schools, um, and I'm interested. I'm taking a class right now by a brother who in his day job is, is running a, a charter school network in, in Georgia, but is teaching this class. And so you're opening, he's opening up the world to the building schools to young men who never thought to want to be a school teacher or go to education at all, but are very entrepreneurial, very innovative, or thinking about space, communication, curriculum, social justice, uh, economics, that I think is an opportunity. And so I just wanted to sort of put that out there that there is at least one course at Morehouse and I imagine other courses and other schools can. Every HBCU had mm. somebody who started a charter school somewhere who could come back and as an adjunct, teach it virtually and just show students, how did I, how did you create this school? What kind of economy did, did, did this school create in the community in which your school is? How much power do you have as a charter school leader to allocate resources and contracts to people who look like us and bring in other African-Americans to do all the other um, business that comes to running a school. There are examples out there. I just want to be, I just want to highlight that. But yes, thank you. Yeah, Chris. I mean, you you asked like the sixty four thousand dollar question, right? Which is, we got to get clear on this. Like, if you are in a classroom or in whatever setting with children, and the children are not learning, right? You're not teaching. Like, mm -hmm. I used to, I, I I taught for a decade, you know, in elementary, middle school. And I coach and do professional development for teachers for years. I used to always tell my teachers, I was like, listen, like, if, if, you, if you can't determine that the children in your care during this time learn and you can't measure that they learn the things you wanted them to learn, right? Because let's be clear, it's teaching when they learn the stuff you wanted them to learn in that moment. Sometimes what they learn is, if, like, if I sit here and don't make any noise, this brother's going to leave me alone. Well, that's not actually a valuable lesson, right? But kids learn that every day. And so we, we do have to get, get clear on if you're doing something and the kids aren't learning, like you might be singing, you might be dancing, you might be playing games and stuff with it. But if they're not learning, you're not teaching. And, and I think this goes back to something Dr. Mons was, was mentioning earlier. Like we've got to get smarter about like all the settings and ways in which children are actually learning in significant ways and have been learning in significant ways for a very long time. And the reality is like, the diversity of that is really broad. I mean, even throughout all of our lifetimes, people have been running, you know, home school environments for their children. People have had small independent schools. People have, you know, private schools, parochial schools, public school, like all of these things. Are, and, and let's be clear, like in just about all of them, there's some, some people in there who are learning. The challenge is in traditional public schools, there's kids in there who are learning. And then there's kids in there who are not. And we've not yet figured out how to like say, hey, this isn't working for these children. Give them a way to get something that is working. And that's because I go back to like my earlier point here. Like we're not as a society and as a community serious about investing in and supporting the success of children into adulthood, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, Dr. Mons mentioned this earlier, like some of that has to be invest directly in the child in services for them, right? And that might look like school, but it also looks like rec centers, libraries, lots of other things that touch children, right? That help them grow and develop. But some of the times that looks like investing in their parents, right? Because mm -hmm. like one thing is true, just about every kid who's school age has some parent or parent-like figure in their life who's spending significant time engaging with them and managing their life around them. And, you know, my wife's a pediatrician. We see this all the time, right? Like, there are just a lot of things that a lot of parents 
either need or need to know that would help them help their children learn. And we act as if we don't know that. Like, we all know that. I tell people all the time, like, I have two children. I was in the room when each of them were born. I can mm -hmm. testify to this. They don't come with instructions, mm -hmm. right? They just don't. And so people who've been successful raising children oftentimes benefit from being around a network of other families, parents, community members who help you figure out how to do it right. And right now we also have a subset of families in this country for decades who have not had that around them. And we act mm -hmm. as if we don't know that's true. We do. Well, let me and press we on that a little bit. Communities. Let me press on that, Sekou, with a tough yeah. question for all of you, as a matter of fact, and this is where you know I think part of this gets real. So we have 8 million black children in the United States. That's 8 million stories and brains that are gonna yep. grow. The intellectual development process of the black child is actually the most critical thing that we have to focus on. We just always have, that is it. That's the whole thing. We have, um, I can't think of a state, maybe someone can correct me, I can't think of a state where fourth grade reading for black children is above a third, a third of them, right? Mm -hmm. um, you look into the prisons, you have something like a 70 or 80% functional illiteracy rate, right? When you look at the number of people who never read a book again after high school um, and have never come to love literature or decoding words, it's, it's crazy. Um, when you look at even the ones, when I say a third reading on, uh, no state with more than a third reading on grade level, I wanna even make that even more real, real because when we talk about proficiency, that's such a low bar. Right, so if you're not even meeting the very low bar of proficiency, I can predict, accurately predict some things in your life that is going to happen, not for your individual life, but for your race of, as a people. So I tend to, to raise these things as, you all know this. I can't tell you a stat you don't know. But what I can ask you is, in a time when we're the richest we've ever been as a people, when there are free and open access to libraries and to information more free than the world that the, the free world has ever known right we have more libraries than molly had and molly discovered libraries years and years and years and years and years and years, and years ago um it almost feels like we keep waiting for somebody to educate our children and i i, I don't know what to make of that i would love to throw it out to you all what are we waiting for who are we waiting for where are we investing our hope that somehow one day by osmosis education is going to land on our children? I can't get my mind around that. Maybe you all can help. I don't know, Chris. I, I can't. I, I'm a homeschool parent. I, um, you know, the, the biggest struggle that I really have is that uh, can we continue to put faith in a system that is not working? Um, um, I don't know. It's it's uh, it's unfathomable. And, and and again, I don't know. I don't know that I know the answer to that. I do think that again, I'll, I'll get back to one other point that when, well, first of all, I think every parent wants what's best for their child. Uh, mm -hmm. But when you have systems and institutions put in place that have created these kind of unintended consequences, where oh, you know, we're all good and dandy, it's all good to go. I think that just takes away people's drive and 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 fervor for freedom and, and being able to exercise their freedom. So I, I you know, I, it, it's, a, it's a tough call. I, I'm like you, I'm uh, revamped the whole system. If we tomorrow decided to have our own school and our own school system to compete with government schools, I think that that would change things. So I, I don't know that I, I apologize. I don't know that I can give you an answer, but you know, and within my household, our decision was to homeschool our children because we thought that in doing so, to your point, that the family is really the kind of microcosm of, of, of educational space. And we wanted mm -hmm. to create that sector. Uh, and it didn't come without sacrifice. Unfortunately, I think people think that college educated blacks have all these resources and the like, and we have all the training that we need. No, it, it took quite a bit of heavy lift to, to homeschool children, but I think it also came with us understanding the economics of doing so the opportunity cost of doing so, giving up something to get what we wanted. And we were willing to give up a lot in, in to ensure that our children had access to education. And that's a question I think it's gonna be a hard nut to crack when you start talking about the role of African-Americans, the role that we can play, the leadership can play in educating our own children because there are people within the community who do have the resources and wherewithal to, to engage but the question is, are they willing to give up something to get what we want? And what we want is a better education for our children. 
And there are a lot of black and brown people, adults who may not be willing to make those sacrifices. And in turn, they're, they're the, you know, the, the low hanging fruit is to send them to government schools. And I think that that's a travesty and certainly at the price that we pay for our kids. Curtis, what do you think? I mean, I, mean, I, I was going to say, I mean, it's everything you said is it's part of a larger conversation we need to have about how for all the things that government has done to black people since we've been in this country, we have some of the highest levels of trust in government of anyone, of any, mm. of any, of any mm. group. Um, and so this idea um, of, of the government's role in our lives um, and something that, you know, dare I say a dependence, um, that we, we, we have to have a, and a, a lot of this is not going to sound super sexy innovative. It's like, do you know wh from which we come? And I'm not saying kings and queens in Africa. I'm just, I mean, people who look like us, who, since they've been on this con, since they've been in this country and everything we've accomplished, uh, outside of the confines of a government that we, you know, that, 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 that we lean on and we give so much faith in. I think about my own experience as a school teacher, I mean, as a school, as school, teacher, as school teacher, but also as a, as a, as a student growing up. And the, and the amount of faith my, my mom had when a school teacher said something about me and how I was conducting myself, how I was learning. That generation was very deferential to, to, to schools. Whatever you say is right, you know, you, you take them, you bring them back. I think we, we have moved in some ways close, you know, away from that, but there's still a level of deference um, from our community to government. And I just said education. I mean, this is, this is in healthcare. I mean, we have I mean, typically black women how they're treated by the healthcare system, there's this, still this sense that, you know, if I go into this hospital, they're going to treat me okay. The doctor's going to give me the, the, the right amount of medication and, and they're going to, but the studies are showing out that it's, 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 it's not. Uh, and, and so the, the closer we get to telling us and understanding, um, you know, just the truth, uh, but also just the idea that the number, so another number that I, I was uh, re recently quoted, so I'm originally from New Jersey, went to public schools there, uh, and a number said the net worth, average net worth of a black person in New Jersey right now is one hundred and seventy nine dollars. Mm -hmm. The average net worth of a white person in New Jersey is one hundred and six thousand mm -hmm. dollars. And so like, when you put that one hundred and seventy nine dollars, like that's that's the net worth of, an, of the average black person. Right. You know, you got half the people on <laughs> below the level. And, you know, but this idea that. In a, in a state that's, you know, has so many layers of government, you know, and it's a township system. And so you have, you know, there are, I don't know, 500 school districts in New Jersey, all with school boards, all with superintendents, all these levels of bureaucracy. But you're telling me the net worth of the average black person is, is $179. Um, huge public school system, very, very strong union state. Um, but at the same time, what's, what, what comes out of it? And so this is why our students are saying, mom, dad, you're not telling the truth because on the other end of everything you're talking about is $179. And so maybe this idea of, of, of what you're selling me is a bill of goods. And so I think there's a challenge the younger generation are pushing back on, on education versus schooling in a way that's unique. Um, I, think, I think you hopefully will have kids looking back and saying, mom, I want to tell you where I want to go to high school. I want to tell you how I learn. I want to tell you what I think is best for me. Will you be supportive? And so again, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, it's having people from every walk of life control, you know, their, our own destiny in a way that I think we haven't had in, in, a, in a few generations. I think this is not historic because I think we were here in a lot of ways, but we have to keep telling our story and just keep reinstilling ourselves that we have the power to do this. But what we've been doing of recent is it's clearly not working. This is like a very interesting point that I think needs more unpacking. Like you need to keep going on that a little bit because um, what I see in that is there was a period of time in the United States history when black folks got all of their protections. Like when it came to things like lynching and ending lynching and ending uh, serious civil rights abuses, uh, grievances against your government was one of the ways in which you got your rights and your protections. And then there was this thing called the civil rights movement. There was legislation passed. So I could see why there would be a lot invested in wanting to get legislation passed and go through political power and political systems and be invested in government. 1970s and on kicked out a whole bunch of goodies after, you know, uh, cities burned. 
after cities burned down, everybody was willing to give out a whole bunch of government goodies. So you have a couple generation of government babies that get that, that get you know kind of created and whatnot. But there are these points in time, like 9-11 is one of them, where kids born in that time came to see the world differently because they were born in this time of crisis. And it's different than the ones who were born before, like pre and, and post internet. And right now what we're seeing is for the first time is you have kids seeing everything fail. You have kids seeing they're, they're home from school, everything has been shut down, everything that they know from government is not working anymore. Um, and, and my question about that is kids are learning that, they're seeing that, and families are seeing that and learning it, but what are we gonna do with that as an opportunity to, while it's broken, reshape the public mind around what could be and what's possible? I see you leaning forward there, Sekou. Yeah, Chris, I wanna challenge that a little bit because I, I'm not convinced that that's actually what all kids are seeing and learning right now. Like to be perfectly blunt and truthful, right? Because I feel like, so a few disclosures, right? Like I'm a public school kid, right? Went through public school, graduated, Morehouse, master's degree, all this other good stuff. My wife's a public school kid, Stanford, doctor, all these, like it's working for us. Like, I mean, there's just, there's just not, there's not an objective case that like it didn't serve us well as individuals, right? Our children, like, we've got one who's now off of William & Mary playing soccer, doing great in college, another one is doing, like, so I think we got to get a little bit more sophisticated about there's no one size fits all. And I tell people this all the time when it comes to school. Everybody needs to have enough information and understanding to know how to make the right choice for their child. Because I can assure you, when people ask, like, they ask you this all the time, like, hey, is that a good school? Well, it depends on what your kid needs. Because there's lots of schools that people say it's a good school. It just happens to be a terrible place for your child. I mean, and that's part of what's happening to black children, right? There are a lot of quote unquote good schools that are terrible places for black people to be in. And that's, no one's learning. No one's that's learning. K through 12, or yeah. even Chris, even like yeah. K through 12 and post secondary, there are schools where everybody's learning but kids are being like actively terrorized and oppressed. I don't see how that's a good environment for them, but like for the kids who aren't black there, they're learning lots of great stuff and going on and doing well in life. Like, so I think we gotta be more careful of, and more honest about, there's a wide range of options and, and, and we gotta be respectful of all of them and all the choices people make. But we also gotta be clear about making sure people have the kind of information, thought, sophistication to make the right choices for them. Because so, so, so I want to ask you right so now, quickly about that. Yeah. On that point, though, Seku, I just want to ask you, is there anyone who's watching government and thinking that government is working well right now? I right? mean, because the question oh, we started oh, this oh, with government, we, we started this with government. Like, we're, we're, we're looking like, at the government in our country right now and ain't nobody saying that. I mean, that's like, my like, point. Like, that's okay. where we started with this was, was <laughs> right. just like people are like young people are probably right now not learning the lesson that government is uh, inevitable and perfect and gets everything right. They're learning like something that we haven't ever learned before, which is it's possible for the government just to be like, this is too big for us to handle. Y'all need to go home. Right, <laughs> right? Well, it is, so, so, so as a counterpoint, like I think what my kids have seen, right? And this is why I say like individual cases vary dramatically. Like in the spring, when schools said, hey, there's something going on, like DCPS closed for like a day or two to like see what was going on. Then they realized, this is going to be a problem, announced they were going to move spring break up a week to give them a chance to plan for what they were going to do. Then they said, okay, you know what? We're going to pull the plug on this. We're going to have these three days set up to everyone to come pick up all that they need from school. And then we're going to go to, here's where you get your equipment. Like, and so I've seen a bunch of kids who actually got exactly what they needed to continue learning and power forward for several weeks. And then you get to the summer and you pivot, like we roll out a plan. And so I'm seeing kids who are seeing for a certain group of people, the government has exact, is, is capable of giving them what they need because they've got the other stuff they need in life to work for them. But what they're also learning, Chris, I think which gets to your point is, yo, there's a bunch of other kids whose lives are very different than mine. And like for some of them, it, it almost looks like, hey, yo, you're on your own. And I think that's like the more challenging issue. Not that it's a, hey, everybody's on their own, but that we live, and this is what I think we're seeing in the country in a lot of ways about everything. We're seeing like this notion that in some cases and places, depending on who you are, like 
The system is there and will support you. And a whole bunch of other people, like the first sign of trouble, hey, you're on your own. Or like not just even trouble, just in general, hey, you're on your own, figure it out. Like, and that's like the tragic part here is that it's not as if we're incapable of meeting children's needs. We're just choosing to not meet everybody's needs. Let, let, me, let me say this, Chris. Chris, hey, Chris. Chris this, this is, um, I'm gonna, I, I've evolved on this point and, and in many ways, uh, when I first started doing the school board, I used a lot of the terminology that Segu, that Segu talks about now, which is it worked, public school worked for me, it worked for my wife, look at us, see. What, see. And the more I thought about that, and I would also mention, you know, he, there are so many students in our system who are doing well, how come the rest of us can't do, how come the rest of you all can't do like, like, like these folks? And I started reading folks like Chris Emden and others who were like, man, Curtis, we have to kind of unpack this. Because to, to hold, hold up folks who, in many ways, I put myself in this category, who people are calling excellent sheep, right? This I did, I was, I was really obedient in school. I was not the kind of kid to challenge a teacher. I was the one who knew if I was quiet, I would get the good grade. I was not the one who was gonna be out there saying, un you know, unleash me and all my creativity as a young black boy growing up in New Jersey. And I knew exactly how to get by. And then eventually I started getting awards. People saying, well, look at Curtis, be like him. And I said, well, and I think right now we're looking back and we're saying to, to, to highlight the exemplar and, and to say that be, be, because they, these folks did it without truly understanding what it took to get to that point. And what we're asking of students to do is one that I think we need to kind of have a conversation about. Because I often highlight in my district, our African students and West Indian students do extremely well. And they graduate and they're the valedictorians and salutatorians. And we talk about, well, maybe they don't think about race as much as, you know, those who are born here do and how they get to the teachers. But in many ways, they are more deferential. They're more, they are more obedient. They're more or less likely to challenge the system because of everything that a lot of immigrants do when they come to this country. Should I be highlighting them as the exemplar, not truly understanding everything that goes into that, that process as well? And so I'm, I'm more careful. I won't speak for anybody else. I'm more careful when I talk about my wife, both my wife and I are both public school students, but I also know that I, I knew how to be a, a, a very good sheep. And I had friends who were brilliant, who were always getting in trouble, but I, but I just knew they were, I just, they were doing things I knew were way ahead of me. And I just knew if I was quiet, but guess what? They're not being held up as the, the exemplar, but I am. And so I think as we're talking about who, 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 the, uh, who we should be highlighting, we need to kind of fully understand what it takes to this idea of how do we clone these folks? Because as Chris Henson will tell you, when they started cloning these things, the people that they cloned had a shorter lifespan and, and, and had a lot of health issues and all the other things that went in trying to replicate something. Because when you try to replicate, which is what public school systems do, is mass production. I don't think there's any, you know, there's any denying what that is, that in many ways, we don't talk about what's being stripped away from our children um, that I think is, 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 is lost. Uh, by by the mass uh, mass replication of of a certain type of student because students will my my children will learn and my son more than my daughter knows how to get good grades my daughter who I think is you know a little further ahead intellectually my son is totally you know rebel I don't care about grade doesn't matter but it's brilliant but my son knows exactly how to get the A and in the end my son may be held as an exemplar but I'm like well son is that that was never my goal. For you to know how to how to how to how to excel and be the excellent sheep, I wanted you to be the best version of yourself, and let me deal with the rest of having to make sure that you are prepared for the world and that you can be everything you need to be. So I think there's a conversation that I just wanted to have. That I think we need to talk about that. I'm sure people from 100 Black Men often use that as well. It was good enough for me, but let's talk about your experience because we seem to oftentimes uh, have selective amnesia about what it took to excel in these environments. And but, it was not always now, healthy for us. Curtis, I want to say that I hope your door is closed, bruh. I hope your door is closed and your son oh, and your daughter. Are, <laughs> okay. Oh, the, oh, the kids are, oh, the kids are gone. The kids good. are gone. The kids good, are gone. But good. I mean, but my, yeah, but my son's yeah, going to be sorry. great. He, he's going to yeah. be fine. He's going he's gonna to go to all the great schools. And I'll tell five years enough, all oh, my son's studying in this school. And they're going to say, wow, he's great. And my, and my daughter is, you know, taking a, a, a gap year. And she's doing, oh, wow, why not? What's, what's, wrong? what's going on? No. She's going yeah. to start her own small business. But there are differences. I think this is a good point, though, that, you know, maybe with this time period that we have now, as parents get to know their kids better, 
because they're having to spend more time with them, that they're going to discover some things. And they're going to discover just how to the lowest common denominator public schools and as you guys say, government schools um, teach that it's actually not to the humanity of the child in a lot of times. I have three and I have learned just in the last couple of months something I already knew, which is that they're all different, but something that I didn't really put as much uh, credit into, which is how putting them all in the same school might not even be the most humane thing to do, right? Like it may not, a lot of us are discovering, now think about that being discovered 8 million times, like over a lot of black children. And imagine the possibility for correcting the story for that many people. There are many parents right now who, and I say this all the time, drop their kids off at a school every day that they think is smart, funny, gregarious, uh, uh, uproarious, blah, blah, blah. And then once they get into that school, they're called other things than that, right? They're called up these other names. And you're like, well, I can't match this up because at home, my child is hilarious and is funny and pulls things apart, drives me crazy sometimes on these things. But then I put them into your school and they're called something else. And possibly that's because of what you just said, Curtis, which is if you don't sit in the, in the aisle the right way, if you're not one of the obedient sheep, as you say, whatnot, any aberration is seen as negative or deficient. I saw you raise your hand there, uh, uh, Dr. Carthy. Yeah, thank you. First, uh, uh, Curtis, just want to affirm what you said. Not that I need to affirm, but it was brilliantly spoke about the not losing the sense of self uh, and, or, or just going through this process of assimilation into a to, to a Euro, Euro culture that you know that was not necessarily designed designed for us, and what that means as far as our trajectory. I mean, what do you lose uh, on that academic path, or what do you lose in your sense, sense of self? So, thank you for lifting that up. Um, but I also wanted to, you know, think of this opportunity. There's a there's opportunity in the chaos that we're in right now, uh, and that I say the opportunity exists because there's. If, if I can, when can we think of another time where? education has been more transparent or on display than it is right now because everybody can see what's happening. You know, when you're in the house, you, know, you're, you can see every classroom, you can hear every, what every teacher says, I can hit the record button right now, everybody can hit the record button. Mom sees it, aunt sees it, everyone knows exactly. So those, those displays or those, you know, willingness to uh, tear down a student or our black and brown students are, 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 not, are not going to, uh, I should say they're not going to occur. We have the ability to see what's going on in dismantle so it doesn't occur. Uh, I also think about this fact that we're, in essence, everyone in education right now is a first year educator. None of us has, have taught like this or educated like this or trained like this. This is all first year education. And so the opportunity to, to undo what we've learned and present education in a new way by listening to the voices of the people that we are serving. We're serving students. I guarantee you they know how they need to learn and I guarantee they can tell you how I will how I will engage and I guarantee you they will tell you if I learn something today or not based off of off that conver off that conversation but it's that willingness to have that and I also just want to speak to like those other systems that there's absolutely no reason to return to why should anyone ever see a child a black and brown child suspended or, or loss of loss of access again now that we see what we can do in virtual education mm -hmm. please tell me why you should ever see anyone lose access to education, uh, given the what we very quickly designed and show that we can access you wherever you are uh, and, and provide provide education resources. So I just want to think about that opportunity that we do have right now uh, to to dismantle and disrupt. Well, to, to, to that point, Doc, I, I know Chris's uh, kids are upset because there's no more snow days in Minnesota. Exactly. There's, there's, no more, there's, every there's, day there's, there's, there's no day. No more, there's no more snow day where, where we, we can't have school because it's snowing outside. Oh. Well, we gonna have school every day. <laughs> you know what's so funny about that? This is what's so funny about that is uh, they're gonna get on our nerves so bad being at home that when it snows, we're gonna make them go outside and have a snow day. <laughs> they're gonna make them go outside and build some snowmen. <laughs> go fly be I got free. a pretty long driveway. I, I got a driveway that could be shoveled. So they, there's work to do and there's some, there's some exercise in that too. We'll call it PE. We'll call it PE that's at that's home. Like old, that's like the old Dewey model of school. Yeah, yeah, so Today's lesson right. is how to shovel the walk. Well, listen, um, I am so grateful for having this time with you all.
uh, in this hour, I want to wrap with some final thoughts from each of you. I want to get each of you to give some final thoughts here because these type of opportunities for us, I think, are important. We need to keep having these, these times where we stop and consider uh, the options in the moment that we're in. And for groups like Ed Choice and for groups like 100 Black Men to give us the platform, the space, the time, the opportunity to bring us together like this, I think is actually where the solutions actually are. I do think that the solutions live within us. They live within dialogue and they live, they live within the, the expertise that we all have. I love this panel because our families are homeschools right now. They are still having to deal with districts. They are still having to know what to demand from leaders like school boards and others and say coup to where you sit. They are still having to confront the idea that they want their child to go to college or be college educated one day, right? So that is a lot for a parent to hold uh, together at once who wasn't trained to be this full-time yeah. uh, home educator. So why don't we do a round of final thoughts? What do you think that the 100 Black men need to hear? What do you think uh, our families and, and the broader mm -hmm. community need to hear uh, to help us get this thing right? I'll start. I mean, and I'll just say, and I'll be really quick. What, what, I've, what I started doing um, as, as a school board member is opening up a conversation with our male educators. I started something called Real Men Teach to recruit and retain more male educators uh, in my school district. And we have a, a call called w the Wellness Check-In. And so it's an open forum. There's no agenda, but it's opportunities for educators to talk about their experience in this space, but also, you know, what's, what's working? Um, what have you tried this week that's worked? Because I don't want us to miss an opportunity where you learn something and then you dismiss it as, as, as not important or something that can't be applied after we go back. And so um, there's kind of twofold. It's really checking in, um, ensuring educators understand, you know, how thankful we are for what they're doing. I don't want to, I don't want anyone on this call who's, a, who's an educator to just, you know, to feel like in any way uh, we don't recognize and, and appreciate everything you're doing to do the best you can. Some of which are hard and, and you're and you're, and trying to, you know, parent your own kids. But I think we also need to uh, really put a uh, put a thumbtack in those things that are working, different ways that you're able to be innovative in this space that we could take from that. And so with the Real Men Teach campaign, really how we, you know, organizing, particularly you know, educators, but other educators and parents and others to really uh, make sure that we don't miss out on the opportunities and the learning that's happening um, as parents and educators in this space so that we can apply it uh, more widely uh, when we come back. Uh, Chris, I'll, I'll share a few things, a few thoughts uh, to your audience, to the, the listening audience. One, I think that, you know, as we think of the role of teachers in, uh, in the current system, that, you know, teachers are neighbors, teachers are a part of a broader community. So I think that it's important that families understand that the resources and the geography of opportunity that exists within their own space. That's one uh, issue I think that we need to leave with the uh, audience. Another thing is really that parents have freedom and that uh, being able to, to exercise said freedoms as it pertains to educating their children is critical. I think another thing that we should all think about in terms of our role as now educators within a broader space is really trying to take hold of this, this inventory of our respective comparative advantage as parents. And also even as we look at our children uh, I think that every family, every family should sit down and ask themselves, what is education for? Uh, and, and understand and how to, to kind of curate those, even those non-cognitive skills that their kids may possess. Um, because again, uh, you know, now is the time to disrupt education. COVID disrupted it for us. But again, I think it's important that we be innovative and think uh, really from the mindset of, we, we, we can do this and, and it certainly is going to take a heavy lift and some strong decisions. And I love, love the example that you gave in terms of putting leaders in a room and brainstorming. brainstorming. I think that once, once that comes to, 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 to a better understanding, I think that teachers and schools and you know, communities will start doing right by our children. But right now, if there's no accountability and you got D and F schools for three, four, 10 you know, years in a row and they're still getting the dollars for failing our kids, I, what is the incentive to get better, right? So we'll see. Seku? Yeah, um, I mean, I think a couple things. Like, you know, one is that we have to, we have to be way more reflective. But I think this is something that our organizations can help people do is be more reflective on 
what's the extent to which we're not holding up our end of the bargain? Like the institutions are failing us because we're letting them. I mean, we, we like, we gotta be more brutally honest with ourselves, right? Like people who report to us who we're supposed to hold accountable, we have not. And therefore they fail to deliver for our communities. And, and, and we gotta stop acting like, we don't know what's going on. We don't like, it's like, it's, it's a magic show somehow. Like, and so we've got to show a greater level of will to confront those sort of harsh realities. Um, I think, you know, so there's something Curtis mentioned earlier, like this moment that we're in through this pandemic is a, is a one going to be one of the greatest opportunities to learn in our lifetime. And the fundamental question is going to be, are we going to take the opportunity to learn and apply it? Or are we just going to like, get through this moment and then go back to some version of the way we did things before. Cause we liked it that way. Right. And so, you know, it's a choice. Like there's, there's no guarantee that we're going to, that we're going to learn and, and activate the lessons from this experience. So we got to be careful about that. And I think we got to also think a little bit more about like how much is there to be learned about the focus on what's wrong and what's not working. I mean, in my career, I've learned way more from looking at the things that do work than the things that don't. I mean, it's just all the things that don't work to tell me is a whole bunch of stuff to not do. Like a, a, a to not do list is not helpful. Mm -hmm. And I think when we think about like, what is it about what works in a homeschool environment or an independent school or any situation that's working and we burrow in on how do we deliver those things that are working for all children and recognize that it's gonna look very different. And so that's a challenge to your point, Chris, like, three kids maybe don't need to go to the same school or if they do, there still needs to be three sets of, you know, customized experiences that support their success. And that's not easy, but it may actually be the only thing that really works. And we have to acknowledge that like, when you look around at where children are successful, like I would push back furiously on Curtis's notion that it's about sheep. Like that ain't at all. Like there's a set of interlocking experiences that are working for children all over the place. And we refuse to like apply the intellectual rigor to dig in and say, why is this working for this child? Let's figure out how to present that to many more children. And then when it doesn't work for this one, what works for kids like this one and like build those connections? Like, we don't want to do that. We want to find like six boxes and say, let's put each kid in one of those boxes. And if it doesn't work too bad, like it's it, like, I hate to break it to everybody. That is ain't the way it's going to work. And those of us who are raising children, like, we see that in our day-to-day -day life. It's not, it doesn't work that way. So I think we got to lift up more of the examples of what's working and then dig into like the why it works, which is like be more intellectually rigorous about what are the things that matter here? And there's a whole bunch of things that are in there that actually don't matter. Like we just, mm -hmm. we got to be acknowledged. Like there's stuff that's happening in some schools that we like, but it's not, a, it's not adding to the, to the learning. So let's just like strip that stuff away. Um, and I think finally, like we got to be, really really forceful on the notion of fit like if it doesn't fit to a child like it's not going to be good and that's going to be hard for adults but like the education thing is not for us right it's for the kids and so when we're busy like running experiences or systems that work well for us but not for kids like that doesn't make any sense and i think we, the reason we need to be spending more time with our organizations in our communities is to like help people understand. And I think one thing Curtis is absolutely right about is there's a lot of wrong lessons people have learned about what works in education and like, why can't everybody do it the way it was when I went to the school down the block? Well, because first of all, it didn't work for a whole bunch of people who were there. Like that's the thing people overlook. And so we have to help have those conversations in our organizations. Cause one thing I'm not gonna do, and there's a lot that's going on is like, I'm not gonna get out here and say I'm for black people and not black people, no. Like, I'm gonna be for black people and I'm gonna be for them when I like them and when I don't like them. And I'm gonna be for them when they're nice to me and when they're not, because I'm for black people. And you can't be for black people and then be against them and, you know, and put them down in public in ways. So I think, you know, the challenge for our organizations is to bring people into those safer spaces, have conversations like that can be critical and honest and like dig through some of the stuff that's incorrect and they get to the bottom of like, okay, now what are we going to do? But when we get out here and public and put everybody else, like, we're yeah. going to be together because that's what we need. Yeah, that's a great next step, I think, too, for everybody is to start bringing uh, networks and groups together that can actually hash these things out.
let's work it out. Dr. Clardy, what do you have to say? Final thoughts? Uh, thank you. What I would just say is mostly the parents is don't, don't forget who has the power and don't, don't relinquish that power. Schools cannot function or will not function through funding or either without, without students. You know, and I, I don't want to talk about students as a resource, but without the resource of the student, the student school doesn't exist. So you, the parent actually holds the power of if my child attends there and that funding goes with, goes with, goes with that child. Mm. I think there's this, sometimes there's an overtrust in, in, a, in a, like a government based, based school that this was what, you know, I, I have to send the student there and ho hopefully they succeed or, or, or maybe not. And actually the parent actually holds the power in the expectation and the accountability of if my child will go there or if I pull my child out and, and your, your funding is lost based on there and your inability to function as, as a system. So it's that leveraging that, that mindset of who actually is in power there and it's the, it's the parent. Well, I have thoroughly enjoyed this. I definitely think that uh, the powers that be put together a great panel of folks. I think actually I would very much trust all of you to go into that big meeting and to hash these things out and have it come out the right way. I would really um, see so many lessons that we could take away from you all, but all of our people have that in them. All of our people have those experiences, those things. Curtis, you and I have talked uh, before about the 5,000 schools that Booker T. Washington and, and Rosenwald started, and that was a community um, government and com commercial process, uh, uh, partnership of which, but it was made out of everything that's made out of uh, for African Americans, which is out of necessity. Necessity is the mother of an invention. To have someone here to talk to us about homeschooling as an option, that has been the choice that has been off the radar for the longest time for black folks in, in, and to have it be back on the radar again, these are our kids. We are the, we are the guardian that God gave them to like de defend their intellectual development ruthlessly. Um, and and uh, between homeschooling and starting our own schools like Rosenwalls and remembering that we have intrapreneurs like Dr. Clardy who are working within districts right now who we could be partnering with and thinking things through with. Um, that is the, that, that's the full circle to me. That's the circle of life. Homeschooling, building your own schools, having opportunities and resources, and looking for the entrepreneurs who are probably within the system where we could get some help too. So thank you all. I appreciate you all. You're brilliant. You brought so much to this. And for our, um, for our host for 100 Black Men, thank you for all that you do to create the connective tissue between Black men so that we can actually really be a power in this country that is no more needed than today. <laughs> today, we need that more than ever. So thank you all. Appreciate you all. I want to thank you for watching this opening session of our virtual education town hall. I hope that you found this conversation enriching and informative, but this is just the beginning. As Chairman Dorch mentioned in his greetings earlier, we have three additional sessions for you to view. You can check them out by visiting www.edchoice.org backslash 100 Black Men Town Hall. Watch them with your family, share them with your friends, and give us your thoughts and comments. It is our hope that once our communities get through this COVID-19 pandemic, we can have these, these types of conversations and dialogue directly with you and your communities. We want to make sure that all kids have the opportunity and resources they need to succeed so we can build the next generation of leaders for our community. I thank you for viewing our virtual town hall and we wish you the best.